Right. Um, well, thank you very much for introducing me. Um, yep, I'm a bit of an interloper today, talking about uh, the far north rather than Wales, but hopefully it's got some relevance to what you are doing uh, further south. Um, so a lot of our recent work has been part of the Comparative Kingship project uh, here at Aberdeen, which is a Lever Leverhulme-funded project um, that's been running for uh, three and a half years so far. I've got another um, year and a half or so to go. Um, and part of that project really is looking at this crucial period, the first millennium AD, in a comparative context. Uh, and part of our comparison, unfortunately, isn't Wales. It would have been a, a fantastic comparison for what we're doing, but we're more focused on areas further west, um, comparing Pickland in particular to the uh, Gaelic-speaking areas of Dalreda and also Irish areas such as uh, Munster. Um, and one of the key uh, areas of focus of the project is looking at the rise and fall of central places, particularly fortified uh, complexes in Ireland and in Scotland. Um, the problem, of course, of a comparative perspective is that often the comparison is not very favourable to your own particular study area. So if we're comparing Ireland to Scotland, for example, we can compare the incredibly rich enclosed settlement record um, of Ireland, 47,000 spring forts uh, and counting, uh, hundreds of these excavated, compared to the very, very sparse record in Scotland, which is much more similar to Wales in terms of the number of sites known uh, and identified. So something like uh, almost 1,700 hill forts in Scotland, um, but only uh, 27 or so of these have early medieval dates post 400 AD. So we are dealing with very few sites uh, indeed. Um, and if we look at uh, sites with you know high degree of certainty of dating, then we're dealing with a very, very small data set uh, indeed. Um, so if we look at historical sources, that helps flesh out the picture slightly, but you can see the biases in sources. So for example, lots of ninth and 10th century, century references to, to Southern Scotland, for example, uh, where the focus of the Pictish kingdom seemed to shift in the later first millennium AD, whereas um, our archaeologically identified sites are slightly more evenly spread. Um, but again, big biases in terms of you know, where fieldwork has been targeted uh, and the nature of that fieldwork. So many of the um, uh, formative excavations have been very much keyhole in focus, providing a chronology um, and basic characterization, but not much more than that really. And that's where new fieldwork comes in, which is one of Andy's concluding points re uh, really there. And I can't emphasize that enough, how important new fieldwork projects are and how ambitious they've got to be. So when we started looking for more early medieval sites in our area in Pickland, um, we started off with enclosed sites, hill forts, um, and have excavated many, many sites now dozens of, of hill forts in a, in a sample um, keyhole uh, fashion, just, just to get a basic chronology. Um, but one of the concluding features of that programme of work has been how few sites are actually dated to the early medieval. Um, so you could probably call our project the 400 to 200 Cal BC project in terms of you know, many of the hill forts turn out to be of that uh, date. So really, uh, what we can conclude from that is that early medieval enclosed sites were actually rare in Scotland. So um, it's never going to be the case, I don't think, that we'll have the tens of thousands of enclosed sites that uh, Ireland has in terms of ring forts. Um, we uh, can see that in Scotland that enclosure and fortification was, was a much rarer occurrence and clearly um, part of a, a particular elite strategy within early medieval society. Uh, and we can also perhaps see that through the, the rather limited historical sources we have for this area, where fortified sites uh, are much more prominent uh, than elsewhere um, in, uh, in early medieval Britain and Ireland. Um, so what was the reason for that? Well, in terms of, you know, the 
uh, exclusivity of, of enclosure, then perhaps it's something to do with the scale of kingship in these different areas. So we can compare the um, very successful overkingship of Pickland, which ruled over quite extensive areas of territory from at least the seventh century, um, seems to contrast to the um, perhaps less developed or less um, extensive kingships uh, or kingdoms occurring in places like Ireland. Uh, and it's maybe that the forts are crucial to that um, extensive uh, kingship that's happening in uh, places like uh, Pickland. Um, it might uh, help us understand um, how the Picts were able to rule over such um, large areas at, at quite an early date, something that clearly uh, perplexed Chris Wickham, uh, writing in 2009, um, talking about the extensive uh, kingship of um, Honest of the 8th century, for example, uh, how the Picts managed this with no visible in infrastructure and one of the most unpromising terrains in Europe remains a mystery, but they at least show it was possible. Um, so perhaps helps us understand how that was indeed made possible through the quite exclusive use of, of fortification uh, and uh, the way that uh, more extensive kingships were perhaps uh, formed in, in these areas of eastern and northern Scotland. So in terms of, of, of fieldwork and um, how we might begin to flesh out the record, then again, it comes down to um, more invasive uh, and extensive programs of fieldwork. So I just wanna outline that by looking at one case study um, from, from our work, which some of you be aware of or very familiar with, uh, which is in Rhiney in, in Aberdeenshire in Northeast Scotland. Uh, and what we've found here is not just a single fortified site, but a whole series of them, um, talking of the landscapes of power that, uh, that um, Andy was, was mentioning uh, in his presentation. Uh, so we now have sites at uh, Cairn Moor uh, in the southeast, uh, the Crossdane enclosures in the centre of uh, the Strathbogie uh, Valley here, and Tappanoth to uh, the north. Um, so we really, we started off working at Rhiney, um, not realising this was really the, the tip of the iceberg, really, I guess, for um, our uh, understandings of early medieval landscapes of power in this region. Um, and there was a number of clues why we investigate this site. One was the uh, place name, uh, which comes from the early Celtic word, re for king. It seems to mean a place associated with a, a great or a sacred king. Um, and that place name is actually closely uh, located um, on the earliest maps we have in the area that we've been excavating at the cross Dane enclosure, suggesting this was, um, or thought to be in a later period, the main site of, of kingship or a place associated with kings. Um, the sculptural evidence was also very rich from this area, including some unusual full-length figures, including the Rhiney man carrying his axe there, a warrior figure, down by the village talking of the martial um, power associated with these uh, early kingly groups. Um, and this stone here, the cross team, is where it still stands in situ and where our excavations have taken place. And these have been large scale strip and map um, with a sample excavation of features revealed, revealing most of the complex uh, here um, over a period of five seasons of, of fieldwork. And here you can see the areas investigated um, through, through trenching, allowing us to identify and characterize the interior of the enclosures here, revealing a number of different buildings, features, structures, uh, and things like a, another stone socket, perhaps for the Rhiney man himself, who was found during plowing down slope from the cross stain. Uh, and then nearby at the village, there was clearly a cemetery, a contemporary cemetery, with our excavations revealing square barrows and what have been interpreted as, as shrines or, or temple type structures um, next to the burial monuments and the warrior figure coming from uh, a burial monument uh, itself. Um, and the finds assemblage is, is, is very rich, especially considering this was a, was a ploughed site um, with a number of late Roman emperor vessels, um, 
glass from Western France, um, bronze objects, uh, and also things like locally made pottery, which we didn't know there was a local tradition of pottery making prior to our work. Uh, and nearly all these fights co uh, finds come from demolition layers in, in the outer ditch. So it's the, uh, all about the abandonment of the site that these finds uh, relate to largely. Um, and we have a huge evidence for production. Um, we've got vessels for uh, refining um, uh, silver or, or, or bronze, uh, metalworking tools, um, things like uh, these um, tongs here, uh, ingot molds, uh, cru crucible shards, um, huge number of mold fragments, and also in situ evidence for iron working in terms of furnace spaces and, and lots of slag. Uh, what were they making? They were making uh, large penannular brooches. Uh, we've got molds for the pins of these, uh, got molds for the terminals. Some of these were, were decorated uh, and they resemble in size and shape and character some of the rare uh, hoard finds that we have um, uh, from Scotland, like Norris Law and Gold Cross Hoard. They're making small penannular brooches, um, hand pins, um, other miscellaneous objects, which some of which have yet to be identified. Um, and also animal figurines, making these small um, uh, metal objects that may have been helmet fittings or some sort of uh, fittings on, on other objects. Uh, and these, these animal figurines closely resemble the animals you find on uh, the contemporary picture stones, allowing us to pin down the chronology of some of these stones uh, to a greater degree. We also have bits and pieces of material culture that look more cult in nature. So we've got this uh, little axe pin with a serpent on the end, and we have this little bronze plaque with, with a face or what uh, appears to be a face on it. Um, so that along with things like the Rhiney man carrying his uh, axe uh, have led us to suggest there is a, a cult component to the site in the fifth and sixth centuries AD. We also have uh, bits and pieces of weaponry, uh, sword, pommel, um, a small knife. And as I say, these little figurines could come from something like uh, uh, helmets. Um, the excavations have allowed us to produce a, a really detailed chronology for this site, around about 50 or 60 radiocarbon dates now. And it's important to have that number of dates in terms of modeling the start and end dates of the sequences. And what we can see from this is that this site started in the late Roman Iron Age in the fourth century um, and went through to the mid sixth century when it seems to have been abandoned. Um, in the background of, of the cross stain enclosures is this site, Tapa North. Um, and this has been the real revelation of the project in the last uh, year, year or two. Uh, and this is the uh, lower enclosure here. Uh, which has turned out to be late Roman Iron Age, early medieval in date. Um, it's got an Iron Age hill fort on top, um, but it's really the lower enclosure that we're particularly interested in here, which was always thought to be late Bronze Age or early Iron Age in date. And you can see it encloses hundreds of, of um, house platforms on the hill here. Um, and it was in 2019 that we went to investigate some of these and showed that the rampart uh, which encloses something like 17 hectares in extent, so a huge site, um, and had a palisade on top, which must have been going for about 1.5 kilometres around the circumference of the site. And every platform we've excavated so far has got clear evidence for occupation, including uh, late Roman amphora imp imports uh, and earlier Roman imports from the third, fourth centuries AD. And these platforms seem to go from the third century AD through to the sixth uh, century. Um, and the rampart itself seems to date to the fifth and sixth centuries AD. So we can see this 17 hectare um, site is enclosed in that uh, immediate post-Roman period, which is a real surprise for us. If we, um, prior to excavating here, we would have said, um, like early medieval Wales, that all the early medieval sites are, are small in nature, less than a hectare, um, and this has been a real revelation. Um, but there was also at least one more enclosed settlement in, in this landscape. So just to the southwest, southeast sorry, of, of Rhiney, um, was Cair Moor, uh, which was enclosed by um, timber revetted uh, stone banks, 
with a huge building in sight. And the dates for this extend from uh, the 4th or 5th century AD through to the 7th century, so slightly later than the other two sites. So what this leads us to, to identify is not just a single elite focus within that landscape, but a, a multifunctional central place complex, a bit like what we uh, have identified in uh, Scandinavia, with lots of different potential roles for these different enclosed sites within, within the landscape. Touched upon many of the roles that Andy uh, mentioned, you know, clearly elements of residence here, perhaps places for um, mustering of troops, uh, production, trade, collection of tribute, uh, all these kind of roles we can imagine and that at times attest at, in this landscape. So through this more dedicated promo, program event, investigation, we're able to build up quite a detailed landscape picture of these different um, fortified complexes, enclosed complexes, and how they develop through time. Um, so all to play for really in terms of interpretation, but we could perhaps posit, it, uh, posit some sort of, you know, assembly role for tapping off in, in the early phase at least, giving um, a focus to, or, or giving birth to uh, a place of, of royal residence and um, uh, cult in the valley in, in the late fourth, fifth and sixth centuries AD, uh, and Caremore perhaps being a dependent settlement uh, depended upon um, the royal place in, in the valley below. So really to conclude, um, I think, you know, the comparative approach is really, really fruitful, even though at first sight it can seem that, you know, your own study area seems quite bereft of evidence. Sometimes that is quite telling actually about what role some of these sites might actually be playing or the very important role they might be playing in early medieval landscapes. Um, so I really think there's a need for extensive, so targeting many different sites, as well as intensive uh, excavation programs, looking at in detail um, landscape blocks in terms of the development of these sites through time and looking for evidence for multifocal um, elements to, to these landscapes. Uh, what we can see in Pickland is that some of these fortified centres certainly emerged in the late Roman Iron Age. We do have a bit of a break between early Iron Age and 5th, 6th century sites, um, but there are one or two sites beginning to fill that gap now. Um, and we can certainly see that there was more um, developed and more complex sites from the 5th and 6th centuries, where we see the language of, of kingship and rulership perhaps developing in a more detailed level with things like the sculpture stones and the images of or cult images in some cases suggesting a sacral dimension to kingship in that uh, 5th and 6th century uh, context. Um, in terms of you know focusing on particular sites we've 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 had that in Scotland as well we've had a rather myopic focus on one kind of royal site in Scotland the, the uh, nuclear forts in particular but places like Rhiney really show that uh, there was a real diversity to early medieval sites in Scotland. And through programmes of investigation, we can transform our record. Uh, for example, you know, we had a handful of settlement sites from Pickland prior to our work. But if there's you know, hundreds of sites, hundreds of house platforms on Tap and Off, for example, we've overnight transformed our settlement record into something that's much, much richer. Um, in terms of uh, contrast to the historical sources, I think the archaeology is beginning to suggest new narratives. Um, so there's been a tendency in recent historical scholarship to see Pict Pictish overkingship and indeed Pictish identity as being a really late feature of the 7th century uh, or later. But archaeology, I think, is showing that some of these central places, some of the language of kingship has a much longer um, uh, term uh, process of development. Uh, and finally, we can see that forts remained important sites in Scotland, at least into the late first millennium AD. Um, and the important aspect of that is that many of those late dates come from archaeological investigation, not from historical sources. Um, so it's important to have a broader archaeological record and understanding uh, really before we can begin to draw conclusions about the um, short or longer term role of these fortified centres through time.